begin by acknowledging with honor and respect the indigenous nations on whose traditional ter territories the university stands and whose historical relations with the land continue to this day. We also acknowledge the elders past and present present, including the MSU's current Council of the Elders, and humbly ask for their guidance. The Valley of the Flowers has been and remains a place of learning for Native American peoples who for millennia have passed ways of knowing, being, and doing from one generation to the next. While land acknowledgement is not enough, it is an important social justice and decolonial practice that promotes Indigenous visibility and a reminder that we are settled on Indigenous land. And All right. That, I think we'll pass it off to you. Okay, that sounds good. Hi, everybody. Um, happy to see everyone here tonight. Um, I'll get my share started. Uh, we're talking tonight um, a little bit about nuclear power. And uh, it's definitely out there on the horizon for us. That is, most of us know it exists and uh, know that it's it's something that uh, is part of our, uh, I guess, our 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 power um, makeup in our country and in the world. Um, but the question is, is is it on the rise or is it kind of going away? And I'm going to present to you quite a bit of information tonight. And I'm going to leave that question kind of unresolved and let you all sort of ponder it a little bit. Okay. So this is where we're headed this evening. I'll give you a little bit more information about me and uh, why you should trust me. Um, uh, why, why would I say, uh, I guess is, is potentially uh, valid and factual. We'll learn a little bit about nuclear fission for those of us that aren't physicists, like some of my uh, students in, in nuclear age class have been. Um, we will talk about power production from fission and how that works. And then we'll get into what the current state of nuclear power in the US is and what issues are with expansion of nuclear power in the US. And then we'll kind of end um, talking just really briefly about new nuclear power technologies. So my disclaimer is that I am uh, squeezing what I fit into my class in probably, oh, I don't know, like six weeks of instruction into an hour here, just a big overview. And any one of these topics could well be a class unto themselves. So we're really getting an overview here. Um, but I hope it's enough to make you curious and want to find out more. Okay, so <clears throat> I 20 years ago or more now, this is kind of um, I was in your shoes. I was a student at Montana State in the Honors College, and uh, I was studying civil engineering. And I originally thought that with that degree, I might do something like work with the Forest Service to build bridges um, because I just thought being outside in the mountains was really great. My family had just moved to Bozeman three years prior and I couldn't get enough of everything that Bozeman had to offer. However, um, the summer after my freshman year presented me with a unique opportunity to do an internship in Los Alamos, New Mexico, which is the picture shown on the right of the slide. Um, Los Alamos, New Mexico was not something I had ever heard or even really pondered before. Okay, so I knew vaguely about the Manhattan Project and that it had taken place there, um, but I didn't know anything about the area, didn't know anything really truly about what, what the lab, Los Alamos National Lab really did. Um, but I went for it because, you know, as a freshman in, uh, in school, it was pretty unique to have an internship opportunity and I just, I dove in, okay? So it turns out though, that this internship really changed my life, right? So I went from thinking I might wanna design these bridges for the Forest Service, that was the, my limited view of what I might do with my degree at that point, um, to, whoa, I could work at this national lab. This place is amazing. Okay, I interned there from 1998 to through 2000 in the summers, and I think I even took a semester and did like an internship semester 
Then I got my master's at Virginia Tech in engineering mechanics, and then came back and worked at the lab uh, full time in their weapons analysis group as a technical staff member, because that is really a lot of what Los Alamos does now, which is stewardship of the nation's nuclear weapons stockpile. So I worked there until 2007 when my family and I, which at that point consisted of myself, my husband, Steve, and our daughter, Claire, we decided to move back to Bozeman. So I spent quite a bit of time at Los Alamos. And um, just by the nature of being there, you start to get really curious. Um, there were bits and pieces of history just everywhere, okay? So, you know, I obviously learned a lot more about the Manhattan Project because you could not not learn a lot more about the Manhattan Project being there and, and in, uh, in Los Alamos itself. Um, the pictures I'm shown here are uh, Robert Oppenheimer's residence, which was a place we passed by regularly on our walks um, when my husband and I first got married. Um, this picture on, sorry, I, I'm assuming you guys can see my cursor. Is that right, Teddy? Can you guys see my cursor? Okay, good. Okay. Um, the picture on the top left is of uh, gun site, and that is where they did experiments for Little Boy, um, the nuclear weapon that was, uh, was, was dropped during World War II, the, the first one. Uh, and then the bottom picture is uh, V-Site, and that is where Fat Man was stored for a while. And these have become part of, oh, there's a national parks, a national, uh, like a registry of historic places, but they're back in classified areas, so you can only go see them every once in a while. Um, and they're trying to get money to restore these places, although I would almost guess that they didn't really ever look a whole lot better than what you see there. Um, they have, were always just kind of getting by on, on crummy buildings and whatever they could, okay? So really lots of cool history there. Uh, started learning about the history of the weapons program. Um, I myself was involved in that um, and started just asking myself lots of questions. Uh, oops, okay. So uh, eventually I became really interested in all things nuclear because you cannot have nuclear weapons without nuclear power and you can't have power without the weapons and they're just very much entangled with one another okay that those two scientific histories are very very tangled up and so there's this amazing scientific history that led to the manhattan project and there was, you know, the role that that played in World War II and then subsequently the Cold War. We spend a fair bit of time in my class talking about those things. I'm giving them a bullet point tonight, but they're fascinating, okay? It is a really amazing history. Then, of course, the tangled history of weapons and nuclear power. Um, <clears throat> because, like I said, you can't have one without the other. And then the complicated relationship ordinary people have with the word nuclear and then how that relationship varies from generation to generation, maybe even from demographic to demographic. Um, there are a lot of people in New Mexico that are not huge fans of the national labs and, and what their mission is. Um, the, the role that nuclear power could and does play in our clean energy future in our country. And then the problems that are created by nuclear waste, which are many to be fair. And, and then loads more. I it's like geeking out on this stuff is like my favorite thing to do. Okay. So I'm going to ask you guys and people that have taken my class, no fair answering. Um, what is the picture shown on this slide? Anybody know? Anybody, anybody? It's very quiet out there. Teddy it looks like he's barely restraining himself. This is CP1, Chicago Pile 1, okay? And that is the first um, self-sustaining, uh, controlled nuclear reaction that the scientists were able to do as part of the Manhattan Project. That's a ginormous pile of graphite, like think the stuff that's in your pencil, but pure graphite. Um, so super messy, and this guy standing next to it is really, really dirty. And I looked many places to try to figure out who this gentleman was, and I could never find a, somebody referencing who he was. So I'm guessing he is just a, a worker who was stacking graphite for the pile. 
Um, but at any rate, we'll talk more about that in a couple minutes. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, uh, it is it is a beginning, it is not the beginning. So let's talk for those of us that aren't necessarily familiar, I'm gonna just give a brief overview of nuclear fission. And in its most basic form, we have it sketched here on this blackboard-like graphic. We have a neutron that hits a fissile uh, atom or element, atom, atom of uh, uranium in this case, U-235, that U-235 fissions or splits into two not quite equal nuclei or roughly close to equal nuclei, um, and then also releases some extra neutrons. If you sum up the masses of those nuclei before and after this reaction, they're not quite the same. And that little tiny difference is the energy that is released. That's Einstein's equation, right? That we can convert mass to energy. And so here is that sort of graphic a little bit again, um, that missing mass is converted to energy, okay? And so it's that, that energy, that heat, that we harvest either in a really controlled fashion to produce power or in a very uncontrolled fashion to produce a weapon. And we say uncontrolled. I think I would prefer to say that it is uh, released very rapidly, I suppose. Okay. So when we have a chain reaction, we have things like these neutrons hit fissile nuclei that split and then produce more neutrons, which then hit other nuclei and uh, keep the reaction going, so to speak, okay? And that is, in its most basic um, terms, what a chain reaction is. But there's a lot of things that a chain reaction depends on. A chain reaction can depend on how fast or how much energy those neutrons have. Um, it can depend on the geometric configuration, that is how they are arranged such that, you know, we're trying to have the most efficient configuration of this fissile material such that the most neutrons are now directed into other uh, atoms of the material. And then we can do clever things like use other materials that either slow the neutrons down, maybe reflect them in some fashion, back into the, into the uh, material that is fissioning and so forth, okay? And so that's kind of what this graphic is speaking to. Don't worry about um, this idea, that the, 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 don't, don't worry about the details so much as um, what we're trying to show here is that these are slow neutrons back over here in this realm of, of, the, uh, of the plot. And we're looking at, uh, I think, uh, fissions that happen on the y-axis. We have fast neutrons over here. And what happens is not every radioactive element is a fissile element, one that wants to split when impacted with a neutron of a certain speed. We can generate fairly easily neutrons in this thermal range. It becomes much more difficult and harder to have fission in this realm that is the fast range, not impossible but harder, okay? Most natural uranium is 99% or more U-238, okay? Uranium-238, remember that 238, if you can remember back to like high school physics class, that 238 is just telling us how heavy that nucleus is, right? So that's a summation of protons and neutrons. And we have different isotopes of uranium that would have different numbers of neutrons, okay? And so these elements that are fissile, some of their isotopes are fissile in different ways, okay? And so if it's 99% U-238, um, and less than 1% of it is this uranium-235, which has this really nice sweet spot where we can generate neutrons and create kind of a chain reaction, it kind of begs the question, like, how do we do that? Um, and the, the answer is that we have to use some very specialized processes to essentially um, increase the quantity of this U-235 that exists within that material, okay? There are other types of uh, isotopes that are called fertile isotopes, and those 
those um, can be converted into fissile isotopes through what we call neutron capture and then something called beta decay where it gives up um, an electron and becomes a different element. So U-238 and thorium are those types of elements. Fissile isotopes that are most commonly used in reactors are two, uranium-235 and plutonium, okay? And so we'll probably focus most of the rest of our discussion on those. So the question becomes, how do you control a chain reaction? Because um, when you start talking chain reaction, the question that I guess I would ask if I was in your shoes is, uh, like, how do you make it stop, right? If we're just shooting neutrons all over the place, how are we going to make it stop? So let me just make sure I have a share setting right here um, so that you guys will be able to hear this. And yes, I do. Um, and I'm trust you guys will let me know if you can't hear it. But I wanted you guys to watch this little video, partly because I'm also a Lego enthusiast, but partly because it's also, it's put out by Argonne National Laboratory. And it is showing us how uh, Chicago Pile 1 became the world's uh, first self-sustaining controlled nuclear reaction, okay? And it's gonna talk a little bit about these concepts that I have over on the left, neutron moderators, and neutron absorbers. Okay, so it's a little less than three minutes, so let's watch this. Okay, it's got sound. In 1942, underneath the University of Chicago's football stadium, a group of scientists led by Enrico Fermi built the world's first nuclear reactor. The reactor was built out of graphite blocks, some of which contained small disks of uranium. Fermi knew if they arranged the blocks correctly, it would produce a self-sustaining nuclear reaction. A sphere would have been the best shape for the reactor, but Fermi's team couldn't build a perfect sphere out of rectangular blocks, and they weren't sure exactly how big the reactor needed to be. There were no instructions to follow, so they conducted a series of experiments to estimate the correct size for the reactor. First, they built a rectangular pile, then they ran an experiment. One scientist slowly pulled control rods out of the pile, which allowed the nuclear reaction to proceed. Another monitored the reaction on instruments, nicknamed after Winnie the Pooh characters. Other scientists stood by with containers of cadmium nitride in case of an emergency. The measurements from this experiment helped Fermi conclude that the final reactor needed to be a rough sphere with a diameter of about 25 feet. They took apart the experimental pile and began construction on the reactor, which they called Chicago Pile 1. As the pile grew, the team repeated the same experiment again and again. The data from these experiments allowed Fermi to conclude that the reactor didn't need to be built all the way to the height he initially planned. After the 57th layer of the pile was in place, Fermi called construction to a halt. On December 2, 1942, Fermi assembled the whole team to watch the experiment. That morning, they pulled out the control rods as usual. The Geiger counter beeped faster and faster, indicating their goal was close. Fermi knew that with one small adjustment, they could run the experiment again and achieve their long-anticipated goal. So, he called for a lunch break. After lunch, the experiment resumed. Criticality had been achieved, and the team toasted their accomplishment with Chianti, drunk from small paper cups. Okay. Um, so that video is actually really accurate. Um, when you read descriptions of that event, he really did call for a lunch break right before they hit that um, that critical mode where they would have the chain reaction uh, be self-sustaining and everybody was like on the edge of their seats and they couldn't believe that they called a lunch break, but he called a lunch break. So they had to go, they had to eat, and then they could come back and do this. Um, they also did celebrate with this bottle of Chianti and I believe that's on a shelf somewhere in a museum. Um, the graphite, let's talk about that. Why is there this big pile of graphite? 
The big pile of graphite is there to slow down fast neutrons, the ones that would be off the charts on that other graph we were looking at, and put them back in the thermal range so that that reaction will keep going, okay? Um, so that's called a neutron moderator. And so graphite was one of the first neutron moderators, but they eventually found out that water did a really good job of being a neutron moderator. And they use things like heavy water and light water. Heavy water is just um, water with a hydrogen atom that's got an extra uh, neutron in it. And it's pretty expensive to get, um, but places like Canada run their uh, nuclear power plants with heavy water, okay? Um, the other thing that was important in that video uh, was those rods, right? The, the little Lego scientist was pulling the rods in and out, okay? That was, those rods were made out of neutron absorbing materials. Those are like the brakes on the reaction, okay? And they also had a set of rods um, on pulleys above the whole thing that they could have cut had this thing gone out of control, okay? And at a nuclear power plant, that's called a scram, okay? Where they essentially hit a button and the control rods go in and it sh shuts everything down really quickly. Those are typically made out of things like boron, cadmium, and hafnium. Now, the whole trouble with the graphite and the graphite pile was that um, they, Took them a long time to figure out that graphite would work because they couldn't get graphite pure enough and it was ironic because the graphite was contaminated with boron and so they were kind of shooting themselves in the foot with the original graphite that they uh, had tried for in the pile it wasn't pure enough so interesting stories there and these concepts which date all the way back to the manhattan project are not radically different from what is done in a nuclear reactor today, okay, or a uh, power plant. Okay, so let's talk now about how do you get power from nuclear fission, okay? Well, in order to understand that, you have to understand a little bit about how a thermal power plant works. Um, and maybe I, the, this is not necessary, but I love this diagram because it's nice and detailed but we're burning something, be it natural gas, oil, coal, or I'm not sure if that is supposed to be wood pellets or what, but we're burning something in here, okay? We're heating water in a boiler, and then that water is generating steam, which turns a turbine or, or an alternator and then a turbine, and then generates some uh, electricity via the transformer, okay? Um, the waste heat is sent through a condensing unit and so oftentimes what you see coming out of a power plant isn't necessarily anything bad. And I'm talking now about non-nuclear power plants. Non-nuclear power plants have condensers. And oftentimes what you see going up into the sky is steam. However, okay, there's exhaust from this burning process, right? There's, there are products that result from that combustion reaction that also have to be vented. And that's what's happening over here, okay? And they clean it. They use electrostatic scrubbers and they do different things, but we are still sending up things into the atmosphere that are not necessarily real good for it. Another thing to note is that thermal plants that use water or steam as the working fluid, the thing that is providing the power, doing the work, they have to be located near a water source, okay? And so they are both taking water out of that water source and they're also injecting their wastewater back in. This is water that wouldn't have touched anything. It's cycling through these independent loops. It's not touching the stuff that they're burning, but it is getting injected back into the environment. And so you can have issues with this water being too warm for the, the area that it's being injected back into, okay? So some really great things about our thermal power plants, they work really well, right? Especially when they're not frozen over, like recently happened in Texas. Um, and they are generally very consistent at providing base load power, okay? That is why we like thermal power plants, okay? How does a nuclear power plant work? Well, there's two primary designs that get used. And without going too deeply into either one of them, um, it is very, very similar with one really notable difference, okay? We do not have 
exhaust of combustion products. Note that this whole thing here where we are boiling the water using the heat from our nuclear fission process, this is all self-contained. It is not giving off heat from combusting of something, okay? That's not to say that there's no waste products. There are waste products and we'll get to that, but we've got this whole thing being self-contained and so we can heat the water, whether we do it in a single loop here, as is shown in the boiling water reactor, or you can have something called a pressurized water reactor, where you keep that water under high pressures so it gets to higher temperatures before it boils, and in theory is more efficient, not in theory, in practice is more efficient, okay? Um, so we do still have cooling towers, and that's the iconic thing, right? We are always showing the cooling towers with a nuclear power plant, you know, you can picture Homer working at the nuclear power plant in The Simpsons. You can picture, you know, all of these iconic pictures of cooling towers, but you have to be careful because sometimes what you're looking at, you just Google that, is not necessarily a nuclear power plant. It might well be just a regular old, you know, coal power plant or something like that, right? They, they all have cooling towers, okay? And that what's coming out is steam, okay? So, Let's think now a little bit about a fuel comparison. So just in straight up land area, okay? A one gigawatt nuclear power plant, which is shown in this picture, I think this one's in Australia, produces the same amount of power as 11 million uh, 320 watt solar panels at a 27% capacity factor, because they don't, they're, they're not always running at maximum capacity, right? Because the sun is not always shining. So your average capacity factor or, or um, I guess the percentage of running at full bore is 27% on a solar panel. And you would need 11 million of those. So you gotta think about the area that that would take up. Or it would be 939 wind turbines. These are three megawatt turbines. They run at about a 33% capacity factor. A nuclear power plant, it's not atypical for a nuclear power plant to run at a 93% capacity factor. That means it's running at very close to its maximum energy production all the time, which is pretty darn cool, okay? So it is in some ways much more uh, area efficient, I would claim, than um, some of these renewable technologies that we would generally think of. Then of course, when we compare it to some of our non-renewables, uh, oil, coal, and gas, right? One 10 gram uranium oxide pellet, it's not that much smaller than what I've, or larger, I mean, than what I actually have shown there. A 10 gram uranium pellet, guys, is like the knuckle of your thumb, okay? It's that big, it's tiny, okay? That much, or the, the energy contained in that single uranium pellet is equal to a ton of coal, 454 liters of oil, or 481,000 liters of natural gas, okay? So the energy density of uranium is really, really high, okay? So we still have to go in a, out into the environment and we still have to mine uranium. That is still a thing, okay? And that is not a nice process. It is not a uh, environmentally super friendly process. However, we mine way, way less of it, okay? to generate the same amount of energy, okay? I love this one just because I'm a fan of this guy, Robert Monroe, fuel energy density. He says uh, log scales are for quitters who can't find enough paper to make their point properly. And over here, and I'm sorry it got cut up, this is like a stack of the paper. And here's you know uranium compared to everything else. And that's energy density. So energy units per kilogram. Um, so, it's pretty enticing, right? I mean, the, 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 the surface story here is that it looks really, really good. So the question becomes, Oh, you froze there, Mandy. Uh oh, uh oh, uh oh. Any better? You're Am back. That's my back. Good. Okay. Sorry. All right. I, I get all excited here. Um, okay. So here we're looking at uh, uh, CO2 emissions comparison and you can see 
that nuclear is right here with uh, hydro, wind. Um, solar is actually more um, because we're looking at carbon footprint and you know mining those materials, I think, as well. Uh, so that is really interesting to me. So let's take a look. Here's the current map of nuclear power plants in the United States. Okay, there are 97 plants that are licensed to operate. There are none in Montana. In fact, none in the Rocky Mountain West, not even commercial reactors in New Mexico where we've got our national lab and actually the only functional waste repository in the United States and none in Idaho. Uh, no commercial nuclear power plants in Idaho. There's quite a few research reactors in Idaho, but no commercial reactors in Idaho. So that's kind of the, the geographical landscape. Um, let's take a look at what that means uh, in terms of other numbers. Whoops. Okay, there we go. So the, the US produces 30%, fully 30% of the world's nuclear power, okay? And more power from nuclear energy than any other country in the world. What's the country that we always think of when we hear about nuclear? I actually always think about France, okay? We always hear about France is uh, being energy independent, generating uh, most of their power independently via nuclear. Um, and that may be the case, right? They may have a higher percentage of their uh, energy portfolio wrapped up in nuclear, but we flat out produce more gigawatts, okay? Um, it is 55% of our clean energy portfolio. It is considered a clean energy, and I think I just showed you why. Um, but here's the kicker. The average age of power plants in the United States is 39 years old. They are an aging fleet, folks. The oldest plant that is still operational is the 52-year-old uh, Nine Mile Point plant in New York. And the newest functioning plant is Watts Bar built in 2016. So that's four years ago. That's not or five years ago now. That's not super recent. And so what I want to show you on this plot is like that we had this real surge, right, in the say late 60s through the 90s maybe or maybe really late 80s of building nuclear power plants in our country and we were adding 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 capacity and then all of a sudden it just kind of stagnated and went pretty flat and the question is why why do you think that is does anybody want to chirp up i don't know what the standard protocol is in these things but Anybody got a guess as to why? Tom says safety. Matt says Fukushima, Chernobyl. Yes, uh, Fukushima and Chernobyl and really Three Mile Island. Um, and we'll talk about those here in just a minute. Made people get really, really concerned about safety. Okay, so let's look at this. Okay, the, there are new units under construction. There actually are some new units under construction, which is kind of surprising that we have any new units under construction, in my humble opinion. But there are two in Georgia at the Vodal plant. And that's a picture of um, the, the top of the reactor unit being lowered into place. That's apparently kind of an innovative design. I wish I could tell you more about it. Um, of the 53 nuclear power plants that are under construction around the world, that's 53 around the world, only two are in our country, okay? Um, and so, you know, there, there, there's got to be something else behind this. And yes, safety is part of it, but safety in turn has driven some economics, okay? And I want you to first take a look at this very simplified economic analysis, okay? And, okay, I'm, I, this, I can't give you enough disclaimers for this, okay? This is super, just very, very simplified, but it does give you an idea of relative magnitude of costs and payback times. So the information we've got here shows us that nuclear is fully five times as much in capital costs to build as a natural gas plant, okay? Five times more than natural gas. 
okay? And we're talking in the billions of dollars too. So by the time you take out a loan on those $5 billion, okay, that's going to be, that's a huge amount of money, okay? Fuel costs, though, are way, way, way better, okay? 64 million versus 450 million per annum, okay? Because we have such a much higher energy density in our uranium fuel rods, okay? We have run that with, say, 3% interest for 25 years. Let's just guess that our loan is something like that. Then your interest, your interest payment per year is 285 million for nuclear and 57 million for natural gas. It takes, on the optimistic side of things, six years to build a uh, nuclear power plant. It takes, say, roughly two years to build a natural gas plant. Okay, you can sell electricity when you're done, so you do get income, right? It's not all bad news. You, let's say you sell 1,000 megawatts, um, uh, after it's been built per year, um, and you maybe recoup, say, 525 million per year, and they're both producing the same amount of power. So let's look at a timeline of how that works out here. Okay, here's our natural gas plant, construction completed at year two. Okay, natural gas plant becomes profitable at year four by the time you track how the, in, the money ins and outs go over the years. Okay. The nuclear power plant is completed at year six. It takes until year 13 for that nuclear power plant to become profitable. Okay, so imagine being an investor in a nuclear power plant and it's going to take 13 years for that thing to become profitable. That's tricky. Plus, you're in an industry that is affected heavily by changes in regulatory structure, which in turn are uh, influenced heavily by changes in people's politics. So you're very much tied to rules and regulations that you don't have control over. Then if you can hang on till year 13 and then hang on a little bit longer, nuclear power does overtake natural gas and profitability by year 18, okay? And then becomes like a head in terms of how much money you can make. Okay? The approximate lifetime of a natural gas power plant is about 20 years. The average nuclear power plant license expires in 30, and then you either have to close the plant or apply for a license renewal and probably have a whole lot of maintenance costs at that point. Okay, So, dang, it's really, really tough. Okay. Uh, to, to not even think of this as just like an independent investor, um, but even for these very, very large power conglomerates that would be investing in nuclear power to supply power to a large area, um, you're in it for the long term and you're subjected to the whims of uh, federal regu regulations and then also the just essentially the people around uh, the area where you're building the plant and their opinion. And think about all these folks that maybe had something that was in the works, and there were a lot more licenses in the works before Fukushima happened, okay? And a bunch of those licenses ended up getting terminated, okay? So the, the whims of the people um, are definitely something that make a difference to the economics of the process, okay? So other bar barriers to, to nuclear power in the United States are that we don't have a good long-term solution for waste, okay? There is a whole lot of not in my backyard that goes on here, and understandably so, okay? In fact, even here in Montana, where it's like not even a thing, I saw that our local news station was running a story on radioactive toxic waste being transported through our state. Okay, so likely this is per potentially uh, low level waste from Idaho labs being transported down to WIP would be my guess. WIP is the only functional repository in the United States. It's in Southern New Mexico. And mainly it takes low level radioactive waste from the national labs and stores them in dry casks far, far underground um, in a salt bed formation far, far away from people. 
I digress though. What we do have is a defunct um, site that the federal government had originally basically edicted was going to be our nuclear waste repository in Nevada, Yucca Mountain. Okay? And because the federal government simply said, we're going to use this land for a nuclear waste repository, Nevada has spent many, many years making sure that that never happened. And the federal government has spent equally many years researching why it's safe, moving forward with their plans and so on. And yet nothing is stored in Yucca Mountain right now to this day. There's no waste in Yucca Mountain. But that was supposed to be our big long-term plan. Uh, incidentally, transportation of nuclear waste is very safe. Um, these casks are built to withstand diesel fires, massive impacts. Just simply driving it through a town is in no way, shape, or form uh, dangerous unless something really, really severe was to happen. Our plan right now, what we're doing with the waste right now, because yes, the fuel does get used up in that we um, run out of the fissile 235 that's in the fuel rods, uranium 235, and we're left with um, slowly decaying products that are not fissile or fertile, and we have to do something with them. And right now they are stored in pools on site, pools of water, on site at nuclear power plants. And that is not a real great plan. They are, it's fine for the short term. I think for the long term, we would want something like Yucca Mountain or the waste isolation pilot plant in New Mexico, where it would be locked away in a single place um, in, in storage for a very long time, okay? So that's a problem. Uh, it is a problem, though, that other countries are solving. So why we can't solve this is, I think, purely a matter of politics. Okay? And then, of course, I said I would speak to the accidents. And these are the three biggies that come to people's mind when you talk about nuclear power. Okay? Um, on the left is a picture of Chernobyl Unit 4. This is the worst nuclear accident of our time. It caused a 100,000-person uh, city, Pripyat, to be evacuated. Those people could never come home. And upwards of uh, the Soviet Union claims 30 people, I think it's more on the order of hundreds, died um, as they were fighting the fires. Um, they were uh, heavily irradiated to the point that they, they couldn't live anymore. And some of them died immediately afterwards. Some of them died very long, horrible, yucky deaths in a hospital in Moscow. It's just, this is, it's, just, it's, it's terrible. Why did it happen? Um, I just finished reading the book, uh, The Midnight at Chernobyl, and, um, it's extremely well researched. And uh, my impression is that this accident happened not because of some massive failing of nuclear science. This accident failed because of a massive failing of the Soviet government, which allowed designs such as the one at Chernobyl to move forward. This plant was doing double duty, and it's something that we don't do in the United States. And when I say double duty, that means that they were producing power and they were producing plutonium for weapons. And they wanted to run really, really big reactor units. And they ran them uh, as gas-cooled graphite units. The problem with graphite is it's really, really flammable and it's really hard to put out a graphite fire. And so if something goes wrong with graphite, you're in big, big trouble. And there was a series of events that went wrong, and I won't get into all the details, but there was some poor design that was never caught, or if it was flagged and caught, it was not elevated because the Soviets could not admit that their designs were flawed. And uh, bad things happened, okay? Contrast that with Three Mile Island, 
which actually happened a few years before. So to give you a point of reference, Chernobyl happened in 1986 and uh, Three Mile Island happened in 1979. Three Mile Island was in uh, Pennsylvania. There was a problem with the design, but safety systems worked and nobody, zero, zero people, none. Nobody was harmed, okay? Nobody was unreasonably irradiated. Uh, nobody was hurt in the event and nobody was hurt in the cleanup. Okay, uh, but there was an awful lot of anxiety around this. And part of that has to do with the release of a movie that came out literally months before Three Mile Island happened. So Hollywood, thank you, Hollywood, um, released a movie that talked about something called the China Syndrome. That was the name of the movie, the China Syndrome. And that proposed a theory that you could have a meltdown in a plant. So something goes wrong, the chain reaction stops, but things don't cool off immediately when that happens. And so you end up with your pile of nuclear material just slowly melting through the bottom of the plant. And so there was this hypothesis that it could melt all the way through to China. That was the China syndrome, okay? And so that had just come out. This is a very angsty movie. And then something happens at Three Mile Island and man, people got very worried because of course we didn't have complete transparency from the, the power plant or the government initially, um, which would really be the best thing. But for some reason in every accident you read about that almost never happens. And so people got very, very worried, um, unnecessarily so. And then finally, one that maybe you guys can remember, Fukushima. Um, and Fukushima, uh, occurred essentially because of the tsunami that hit Japan, J Japan, and because they tend to locate all of their power plants on the coast, and uh, also because their diesel generators failed. Their diesel generators were supposed to cool things in the event of a scram or some kind of problem, and their diesel, diesel generators failed because of the earthquake, and so they ended up with a hydrogen explosion and some radiation release. However, again, I, I, I don't want to minimize this, but um, while there was radiation release that was above background radiation, and one person was, uh, I, I believe, killed in that incident, um, it was nothing compared to Chernobyl. Okay, just. It, 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 they're still they're, they are still taking care of this site that does happen when we have irradiated sites. Um, they become big cleanup areas, but that happens when we have oil spills. That happens with the Butte Pit. That happens with many other types of things that we tend to just say, okay, well, I accept that as a fact of life. But for some reason, with radiation, people get very, very nervous because it's this thing that folks don't understand and they can't see, and so they fear it. Okay. The reality, though, is that nuclear is one of the safest sectors of power production, and that is the truth. Their industry is so heavily regulated that they have become safer than just about everything other than wind and solar. Okay, And this plot is showing you death rate from accidents and air pollution along with greenhouse gas emissions. So I don't know about you, but that looks pretty good to me, right? Even though, yeah, there have been some bad accidents, this is still a really safe industry, okay? All right, last topic, and then I'll stop talking your legs off. Uh, new nuclear power technologies that are in the works. The ones that I am most excited about are listed here. Small modular reactors, okay? New Scale is a company in Oregon that is now creating reactors that can be hauled on the back of a semi truck. Okay. And they are self contained and they can be put in place um, a lot more quickly than building up these, the gigantic infrastructure that surrounds a gigawatt power plant. Okay. And so 
Uh, New Scale is the first company to have one of their small modular reactors approved by the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And they plan to build a unit in Idaho to test and then eventually connect one to the grid in Utah. And this is within the 10 to 15 year horizon, um, which is actually a fairly short timeline for all things nuclear. So that would be really cool if they were able to do that. Um, there are also folks looking at recycling fuel and they already do this in, in Europe. They look at taking the waste products from a standard uh, uranium uh, fueled power plant and then recycling those um, through something called like, the, it's called the Purex process. And uh, they uh, burn what would otherwise then be categorized as waste and we end up with even less waste, which is really cool. There are breeder reactors that create more fuel than they burn. Again, another relatively old technology with renewed interest. And then finally, molten salt reactors, which if you think about that term, molten salt, okay, so you're running liquid like metallic salt instead of water as the working fluid in these, in these uh, reactors. It's, it's just really crazy to me. Um, that not as the working fluid, but as the um, uh, moderating fluid. And th that interest has surged because it can be used with thorium. Thorium is of interest because it's more abundant in nature than uranium. And uh, you know, even uranium, which is actually really plentiful, uh, is of limited supply. So they're already looking at ways that we could extend the lifetimes by running things like thorium. So that, that's, I think that's pretty fascinating. And then finally, 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 um, fusion power. Okay. Maybe you've heard of something called the ITER project, which is in Cataract, France. Um, the ITER project is trying to run one of the largest tokamaks. A tokamak is a donut-shaped structure that is built to run uh, or create plasma within it. Um, and so it has to generate extremely high temperatures and pressures, and it does so with a toroidal magnetic field. So imagine gigantic donut-shaped magnets. And this is roughly what I've shown is a cutaway of one of these tokamaks. So this is very much like what would be run at ITER, except this is far smaller. The ITER tokamaks are huge. Okay. And they're running that as an experimental structure so that scientists can study all the different parameters that make fusion possible. ITER has been going since, oh, I think around 2001. And they are projected to be functional, I think, in the next five to five, five years-ish. I haven't checked in on their site in a little while. Um, but it's a slow, very, very engineering heavy process that is a multinational effort to try to get fusion power um, a place where scientists can study it. Now, in the meantime, we've had all these little fusion startups here and in Europe that have decided that they can do all of this far quicker than ITER. And uh, there are some pretty big deal folks that are backing these. Uh, Commonwealth Fusion in Massachusetts is the one that I have shown here. And they think that they can get um, ignition with more power out of their tokamak than what they're putting in to create the conditions for plasma. That's what they need in order for this to be viable. They think they'll be able to do that in the next few years. So sooner than ITER goes online. It should be amazing. Okay, And this would give us a whole other option because we generate fusion not from heavy, rare elements like uranium or even thorium, these types of things. We generate fusion from things like hydrogen, okay, very, very common elements that are, as the name implies, fusion. They're smashed together, okay, and that smashing of those elements together generates a helium, uh, a helium uh, nucleus, and a little bit of extra energy. And that extra energy, again, is what we harvest. And fusion is very attractive from a safety standpoint because we are looking at having to maintain perfect conditions for it to happen. 
Okay? If those conditions aren't perfect, it's just going to stop and it's going to be okay. And we're not going to have China syndrome meltdowns going through the floor of the plant. Okay? So people like fusion from a safety standpoint. It also generates way less nuclear waste. The challenges are all the materials that you need to engineer in order to contain temperatures and pressures within the tokamak that are in some cases uh, hotter than the sun, more extreme than that, which is just, I mean, really um, unfathomable to me, but I guess somebody can fathom it, okay? So we arrive at the end, and I'm not giving you the answer to sunrise or sunset. I, I want to know what you guys think. Um, or I, I really, what I really want you to do is to keep learning. And it would be really cool uh, if you came and take my class, took my class. Uh, in the fall, I run our nuclear age, and we talk an awful lot about this stuff along with the history and also the geopolitics that are behind nuclear technologies. Um, in the meantime, if you want to learn more, I've uh, thrown down some good sites to learn from and some really good books to read um, that uh, if you read some of them, then you'd already be ahead on my reading list for my class. So, bam. Uh, and at this stage, I'll take questions. I don't know how much longer you guys can hang around or, or what, but I'll take questions. Yep, so I'll drop the attendance link in the chat, and then as you have questions, you can either unmute yourself and ask them, or you can drop them in the chat, and Kate and I can ask the questions. So, ask away. It's like drinking from the fire hose there, huh? Sorry, folks. All right. So I actually have a question. Um, so one of the kind of technology, it's been a w w around for a while, but it's just kind of coming into light is using nuclear power for space travel. And I was oh, curious yes. if you had any opinions on that. Oh, I have opinions on that. Of course I do. So there's a few different ways that we can think about um, nuclear power for space travel. One is um, these, uh, the like the nuclear battery that is on Perseverance, right? Uh, what is it, MMRTG, uh, I think is what they call that. Uh, Micromodular radioactive thermal generator or something along those lines. And that literally uses heat from plutonium um, to generate power uh, using uh, uh, an electric effect through thermal couple, thermocouples. Okay, and so that, that happens quite a lot, right? And that's been around for a long time. But I think what you're getting at is uh, using nuclear explosions to provide momentum for some kind of interstellar travel. Is that the one that you're thinking of? That's, one def that's definitely one of them, or not even for interstellar, but like interplanetary. Or, or even interplanetary travel, yes. And so that was dreamed up by Manhattan Project scientists back in the day, and they even pursued it for quite a really long time. Um, but eventually it was taken off of the table, I think because you have to get it up into space, and there are too many risks with having some kind of accident between here and space. That's one problem, right? Um, that's the same problem that we encounter with, uh, I have folks that always say, why can't we just shoot our nuclear waste into space? Um, and that's, that's a big problem, right? If we have an accident on the way to space, we spread radioactive debris everywhere. Um, you know, and, and so I think it's back on the table, right? Because we're looking at going to all of these different places now, maybe a lot more seriously than we have been in the, say, the last 20 years. So. That is a really unique technology, and they essentially are sending a nuclear bomb out the back of a spaceship and have a giant metal plate that harnesses the explosion momentum, which is really hard for me to understand how all of that works in outer space, right? And um, 
and then they are each time they blow it up they're gaining speed gaining speed gaining speed and so it's a way for them to go a lot faster um so definitely i think it's called project nerva isn't is that right teddy teddy's my man that always knows of all of these projects i think nerva was the nuclear thermal one project orion was the pulse okay Yes, I've heard of Project Orion and Project Daedalus for the Pulse, and Nerva is the nuclear thermal rocket. Okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, let me look at the chat. I had somebody ask, what containment method does a tokamak reactor use? And that is what I was talking about a little bit. It's essentially, it can be different shapes, but the most commonly used shape, it's, um, it's a donut, a hollow donut, if you can picture that at all. And... Uh, it's a magnetic coil wrapped around the perimeter of the donut, okay? And that is how the plasma is contained. Um, I don't know exactly how that works, um, but I do know that those magnets are uh, ginormous for ITER and have had to be very specially engineered um, and that anything that contains a plasma has a whole host of material engineering problems that go with it. So yeah, it's a good question to ask. Like, what are the other materials that are in there? I don't know, but I know they have to be specially engineered to contain that plasma. Um, Maeve, you had a question. You said, I'm wondering, is there a way to re-stabilize nuclear waste or is there research ongoing in this area? So um, also a very good question. Nuclear waste is, it's, it is, I, I don't know, if unstable is the word that I would put to it, it is decaying. It's radioactively decaying, okay? And so it's got to decay from, uh, through a series of radioactive elements until it gets to a stable element. And to my knowledge, there's no way to accelerate that process to like say, hurry it along. Um, the best we can do is to uh, do something like like this Purex process where we can utilize more of those sort of in-between elements to generate power. Do we think it will be feasible to build a nuclear reactor on the moon? Hmm, that's a really good question. I would think it would be feasible to build a nuclear reactor on the moon. I think that the barriers there are simply getting uh, the materials in place. But I don't see that the moon, the environment of the moon itself would be a barrier. But don't take my word for it, ask NASA, or do, do a little research. Um, Tom, you ask, can nuclear power output be adjusted easily? Oh, heck yeah. Nuclear power output can be adjusted quite easily um, through use of the control rods. Now, it, okay, I say easy, it's not like, um, what do I want to say? It is a fine-tuned process, okay? Tuning the control rods, because if you're familiar with any type of a control system, even your house, right? Think of your thermostat, okay? You turn the heat up or down on the thermostat, and there's a lag period, right? And that lag period is, you know, the thermostat works, gets to the temperature you want, maybe it overshoots the temperature, and then, you, you know, it kicks off again. Same sort of thing happens in any power plant, okay? But it can be particularly touchy in certain types of nuclear power plants, okay? Um, but they can indeed control the power output and they're doing it all the time, okay? That is what those people in the control room are there to do, okay? Other questions? All right. Well, excellent. I hope I see a few of your faces in my class. That would be fun. <laughs> I took Mandy's class and I can attest it is a really fun class. I learned so much. Um, and it's an excellent way to interface science and technology with history and politics. So I highly recommend it.